my father was dying and um, it was at the point where uh, he shouldn't be eating anymore because he didn't want to because I think he wanted to go and the palliative care doctor in that sense said, you know what, if he doesn't want to eat anymore, don't force him. And we had a, a, a lovely woman helping us take care of him at home. And uh, I got, I came over to see him. It was during the pandemic one day and, and he was ailing and uh, I could hear the fight about the food going on in the other room. And I'm like, oh, oh, this is not good. And I could hear like, he doesn't want to eat anymore. And she's still just trying to keep him alive. And um, anyway, uh, she came out and I said, I had a little quiet talk with her going, you know, if he doesn't want to eat, we can't force him anymore. But I turned the corner and he was just like yelling, like, you know, he was so upset and he had dementia. Like, you know, I don't know if people will, experience dementia but they, they can turn into like like children again right mm -hmm. and uh, i turned the corner my head came around the corner and he was mid rant practically and i'm like hey and he like he was raging and he saw me he goes hi <laughs> and i said hey so i was like you're having a hard day and he goes, ah, it's not bad it's like it was totally like he was underplaying <laughs> what was going on and i sat down on the bed next to him and i said well yeah i know pop uh, like, but it sounds like you're having a, I didn't say probably, it sounds like you're having a hard day and I'm sorry you're having such a hard day. And he looked at me and he's like, come here. And I went in and he goes, you talk to me just like my son does. No. Oh. And it was the most beautiful thing my father, I think, ever said to me. Because he was telling somebody else about something that you know, I don't, if people who have parents who have dementia, like you feel like you're making a mess. You feel like you're not, you can't save them. You want to save them. You can't, but it's like, oh my God, you're trying, you, it, it's meant a lot. What we've been doing, you, you, you've been letting me in even through the, 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 it was the most beautiful thing he's ever said to me. So that's kind of one of the last gifts he gave me in the last week of his life. And that stays in me. I get to have that and I get to even, work from that and share that even in a podcast, but also when I have to play something of, of, of that part of humanity, I, I know what that kind of love looks like, you know? Okay. Welcome back to another installment of behind greatness by inspire. Uh, before we get into it here with our, our next guest, Sergio, I would like to invite the viewer, the listener, if you're new, share, review, rate. Uh, if you're, uh, uh, a veteran listener and viewer, do the same. Uh, and if you are so inclined, um, our regular listener knows, of course, that uh, we're a non-for-profit uh, and a charity. So we we run this uh, from the bottom of our hearts and uh, our hearts are bottomless. Um, our bank accounts, unfortunately, aren't. <laughs> so this is not, this is not a plea. This, this is just a... Me trying to be funny, um, which usually doesn't work out. But uh, regardless, uh, oh, check bad. us out. Uh, check us out. Not bad. not bad. Oh boy, I'm being rated too. Uh, uh, go to our website. I feel, like we're, a, I feel like we're at a telethon. Go. Yes. <laughs> what, what, check the board. Check uh, the board. Speak, yeah. Speaking of the 80s and 90s, we're going to talk about that stuff too. Uh, behindgreatness.org. Uh, check us out. You can see uh, where you can donate if you'd like. Uh, we are a charity, as uh, already mentioned, so we issue tax receipts uh, if that is something that floats your boat. Uh, otherwise, when you're there, just, just check out our content. We're on every major podcast player. Uh, now, of course, uh, on YouTube, uh, thanks to Chris uh, helping us out curate uh, curating and uh, reposting and refurbishing some of our videos. Uh, so thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you again to the listener um, and to the viewer. Uh, welcome back. And uh, here we go. So here we have Sergio. Serge Dizio. Sergio Dizio. You, you probably get Serge a lot. Or no? Uh, I get Serge a lot. Uh, Serge is the little... Uh, yeah, Serge. It's like totally... Uh, uh, it gets colonized quite a bit in this country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's something a bit more... Um, yeah, easy to take. Yeah, but no, it's good. I, 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 you get used to variety, Luciano. When your name yes. is like ours, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get, I get Lucy and Luciano, so I get your point. But I, I didn't you know. Lucy? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I used to get Lucy a lot in school. Uh, well, so why don't why don't we go through a little bit of your bio and then uh, you can uh, commence making fun of me if you'd like. 
Um, Serge the Zero. <laughs> well, not. <laughs> oh my God, Try, bringing up trauma from the eighties. Yes, no. I, trauma. Go. go. Yeah, uh, we have, we've had trauma experts too. Uh, Gabor Mate. Maybe we should Good. have him on. Uh, the three of us should be on. Oh, Gabor uh, Mate was on. I I love that guy. Actually, he's awesome. Continue. He's awesome. He's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Serge, uh, not S U G S U R G E. No, 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 no. Serge. Go back to Luciano. There's only so <laughs> often I talk to <laughs> another Italian. Please do not go with Serge. Go, go, go. Okay, go here we Sergio. go. Please. Sergio. Yeah. Sergio Di Zio. Oh, Is that better? Oh, Sergio oh, Di Zio. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So. Sergio was born and raised in Downsview, part of Toronto, um, a suburb part of Toronto. has been working as a television, stage, film, and voice actor for the better part of his life. He has enjoyed a varied career that has made him a familiar face to Canadian audiences and to his always surprise, those abroad. For five years, he was Michelangelo Spike Scarlatti, the bomb and tech expert in the CBS CTV series Flashpoint that is still airing and streaming somewhere in the world while you're listening to this podcast. Prior to that, he was a television radio spokesperson for Bell Canada in the years at the advent of internet and streaming services. His big break was 1994's National Lampoon's senior trip 30 years ago. And according to Internet Movie Database, between film, television, and animation, he's closing in on 120 production credits since then. Through the years, he's worked with talents and heroes on excellent projects, Ron Howard, Scott Frank, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Helen Mirren, Jessica Chastain, Christopher, uh, Christoph, well, excuse me. And just this year, the list already includes Megan Follows, Nick Kroll, Ryan Philippe. He has performed in theaters across Canada and will be appearing in, uh, excuse me, appearing next in Kroll's theaters worldwide premiere of The Bidding War, a farce that takes on Toronto's real estate moment. Um, he has been nominated for many awards and won Best Performance at the University of Toronto's Hard House Festival in 1994 at Gemini for Best, Perform uh, Best Supporting Actor uh, in 2011 and 2015 Dora Maver uh, Moore Award for Best Actor for the Canadian premiere of what was it? Um, it was Stephen Adley Gurgis's The Motherfucker with a Hat. Are you allowed to swear right. on this channel? Hmm. You can do as you be you, Sergio. Be you. Well, that was he wrote that. I just had to say the words. Actors get away with that. Yes. Uh, so yeah. you're going to be my proxy for a lot of things then on this episode. Uh, okay. And then speaking of awards, he will be boarding a plane soon for Valencia, Spain, where he and his producing partners, Colin Glazer and uh, Ravi Steve Kajuria, are in contention for their web series, I Will Bury You, at the Cinema Jove Festival. Is that right? Jove? I think it is. I think it is. Uh, it's already won uh, Best in Fest in Miami, a writer, uh, Writers Guild of Canada Award for Best uh, Writing for Episode Tour. You can watch the entire series on YouTube. And fi finally, this surprised me because I just read your bio before this recording. So this is a nice little... <laughs> uh, finally, Sergio thought he would be remiss if he did not include that he also sat one row and two desks ahead of Luciano in Mr. DeLeo's OAC French class at St. Michael's College School in 1990. So it was Mr. DeLeo, right? Not Mr. Grassi, right? It was Mr. That. Grassi. He was OEC. Ah. And if it was mm. OEC, I think it was what year did you graduate high school? Uh I I didn't went to grade 13. So that was 89, 90, I thought. Maybe it was 90, 91. Yeah. You know what? Right? I think it was a, I think it was another Luciano you were in class with because I graduated in 93. No. Yeah. Luciano, you were like two years ahead. You were in a class with me. You were. And you were smarter than me and you were younger than me. I remember uh, yeah, these details. Right. Yeah, yeah, well, I remember because nice. DeLeo or Grassi or somebody was giving out the papers and going, um, Luciano, good work. Sergio, you have to study more. Something like that. Yeah, they actually both spoke that way. So I. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible that I'm getting them mixed up because, like, that happens with, the, like, you know, Enrico and I, when we were doing Flashpoint, they would uh, say Enrico instead of Sergio. And I'm like, you know what? All Italians look alike to you. And here I am doing the same freaking thing as an Italian. You're doing the same thing. Look at your profiling mm -hmm. already. You're on the other side. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's I won't do. I won't do anything yeah. about it. Surge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, Luke. Lucy. <laughs> Lucy. Good. I am impervious to yeah. that now. Uh, All right. Let's get to it. Yeah. Let's. Well. Let's get to what. Let. Let's. Because I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Yeah. Well. Okay. Let's start with this then. Uh, last time we chatted. So for the listener, obviously, we've known each other for a long time. Serge is much older than I am. 
uh, only two years, but he looks much older than I am. I think that's what I meant to say. Oh, jeez. Uh, but I went oh to school. God. I went. I went to school with a, a gem of a cousin that Sergio has, Rob. So shout out to Rob. Uh, he was uh, yes. he was in my ear. Uh, yeah. Probably blushing if he's listening to this right now. Uh, Which he did like nobody else except maybe his three beautiful daughters. Yeah. Uh, lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sergio, uh, last time we spoke, hey. you said to me, I, like you interrupted yourself while we were chatting. And you said, the channel, the main point is that I, I don't do anything. <laughs> that's the main point that's what we're going to call this yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not going to ask you for remember saying that do you, do you remember feeling that uh, that I don't do anything uh, yeah. yeah yeah I you know what if what if that's what life is what if it's like getting to a place where you're not like trying to do anything but you just are what you are and I'm in a in a profession that likes filming that and then that that's much more interesting than somebody trying to do something hmm, hmm. just existing I had an acting teacher. So who, mm -hmm. who helped me a lot uh, in the beginning too. And and one of the things he'd always start with, John Ribbon, uh, he does Meisner Technique in Toronto, was he, he'd say, um, you know, you put a dog or a baby on stage next to Marlon Brando, everybody's going to watch the dog or the baby because you don't know what they're going to do next. They're just present. <laughs> they're just in the moment. And it's true. I mean, if you watch that Godfather scene with, with Marlon Brando, like petting the cat, you're watching yeah. that cat as much as you're watching um, one of the greatest actors that ever uh, lived. So there's something to not doing anything. There's maybe power in that. You know, the the last time I saw a, I saw a clip on YouTube, uh, that clip on YouTube, I was mesmerized, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, by the rose in his lapel. Because mm -hmm. it just mm -hmm. stuck out so much. Because the scene is bad. That is still, there. yeah. That's still one of my favorite movies. It's one of those uh, films where you realize what it takes to make a beautiful movie. And it's not just the actor. It is it is the set design. It is the costume design. You just see everything show up. Everybody has to show up to make something great. Kind of like maybe making a podcast. Nice. Nice. Well, uh, so sorry, on that topic, I, I always, not always, uh, up until recently, and for a little while, I thought to myself, anytime Martin Brando came up in a conversation, I would think and sometimes say, you know what? Go figure, a guy from Nebraska. <laughs> and then I've changed, I've changed that because <laughs> it doesn't matter where you're from. It does, none of that matters because I bet when he's in it, when you're in it, it's not about where you're from. Maybe it's where you are. Like, and, and maybe I don't mean where physically. you are is, yeah. And maybe where you are, if if you're really in flow, let's say, is where everybody else mm. is. Like you're touching something what does that, mean? that. And I, I mean, like if if you're not busy making a story of, well, he's such a good actor because he went to the school or how you figure a guy from Nebraska could become the greatest actor ever. This is stories we put on people. But meanwhile, hmm. like, you know, if somebody's in flow, uh, and if we're talking about actors in flow, uh, and those performances that really get inside you, make you want to become an actor, that's what Godfather was for me. Um, it has more to do with uh, just being present and letting go of all story. And maybe when you let go of all story, you create story. Maybe. Uh, so uh, you, you, another thing that reminds me, you said just let go. Uh, you started uh, our last chat. I'm so, you know, I, I'm not going to apologize for taking the notes because I've, I've known you for many years. But I'm gonna, I took notes anyway. And I'm glad I did because you're, 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 dropping, you're dropping some gems. Um, and you started off our chat like right away because we were talking about video video calls. So speaking of letting go, you said there is a surrender, a spontaneity, and a trust not seeing yourself on video. Yeah. Yeah. I'm having trouble with that. I don't know if you've noticed. And I just yeah, I just found out this goes to YouTube too. So people I'm I'm not looking at my own camera, but I haven't figured out how to shut it off on your on your uh app. 
So uh, I look down at you, but I can still see my head moving around. I don't like it. Yeah, to get away uh, from a sense of of knowing what I'm doing. It's kind of like what I'm what we're talking about with story about like Marlon Brando with being from Nebraska. Like that story that we put on something. And if I catch myself acting, uh, I'll go, oh, I'm doing this thing. And, and because I'm doing this thing, maybe that's what's good about what I'm doing. But maybe what's good about what you're doing is, is just letting go and, and being open. You know, it's hard to be open when you're aware. I think. Hard to be like open when you're yourself. aware. Love yourself. Interesting. Uh, hard to be. So uh, I'm going to translate that to my everyday. Jeez, yeah. So obviously yeah. I'm not an actor, but uh, you you reminded me also that we we all can and do act anyway. But so my everyday is uh, video calls and phone calls, uh, speaking with clients, partners, uh, and colleagues. And video calls are very exhausting, but video calls are comfortable in that I can transmit more of my character to the person on the other side. And I like that. I, I, I want to feel the connection with people. And I want them to know yes. what I am and uh, what I am actually, I, or maybe who I am. Uh, mm-hmm. And th- if I show them gesticulations, if I, if I smile with, uh, with more than just a voice, I feel that that's more powerful. But if it's just a phone call, sometimes I feel like I can be more animated in a phone call without looking like and sounding like yeah. a clown. Totally, totally, totally. Yeah, it's uh, it's true because we're doing that. We just stipulate to so people can understand more what we're trying to say, and it's like we're we're using sign language and our voice. But then when we become self aware of doing that, which is what can happen in video calls, which is why I shut off my my video if I'm if I have a call back on zoom which not my favorite thing um mm. but uh um when we can just go back to just speaking to one another uh and listening and not being aware of what you're doing but just being aware of what the other person's saying like that's actual true connection isn't it oh, that's a very you're not point. thinking about how it's going in it's just going in you and then you, you just said you were things scared. up without yeah, sorry, but you're offering things up without censoring yourself. You're offering things up without without thinking about, oh my gosh, if I say this, what's it, how is it going to be taken in? It's yeah, yeah, it's trying to quiet that part of my mind. That's the that's been the most helpful thing uh, recently in in um, in what I do, which is just feeling safe in being open. I've, I've said this to a few people on the podcast, uh, including not actors. Uh, there is mm-hmm. something about acting because you said offer yourself up. There's something about acting that's uh, the profession, the vocation. You're you're wanting you're wanting to be in it. It's f- I could see it as being very freeing because you just said offering yourself up. Like you, you that is not an easy thing to do for most of us. Uh, and, and you know, I, I want to offer myself up when it, this is going to sound really, uh, awkward maybe. Um, cause I just, I just listen myself saying this in the future and I'm just checking myself, but, uh, I want to offer myself up when, when I'm on a video call with a colleague or a client, like I, I actually want to offer, I want to offer up who I am again, going back to that. But yeah. you have to tread carefully with people. I used to say, you know, business is not pleasure, pleasure is not business. But, you know, we're all just bloody human beings. And, you know, as long as we get past the judgment, why can't I offer up a little bit of uh, my insecurities uh, or, or, you know, without being too heavy, but a little bit, a little bit more of my own humanity with people? Because really, yeah. I mean, that's what's better than your own humanity? <laughs> it's everything. I think it, you're right. Yeah. I agree 100%. Yeah. And, you know, people get into acting uh, a lot of times. It, it, it's, it doesn't start there. I think it starts because um, it feels like a place where you can go to uh, be emotional and, and offer yourself up, but kind of hide behind a part. Mm. Um, but the, if you get lucky enough to do it for a long time and you live a life in it, um, and you do it for long enough, you kind of go, you know what, all those things that I thought I had to hide, actually, that's the, that's the stuff. That's the stuff that's going to touch people. 
the humanity that you think is not, you, you don't even know uh, how it's going to be taken. That's, that's what makes people cry in a, in a theater. Or that's what makes people rewind or rewatch a movie over and over again. It's like, I see, I see somebody's soul, you know? And why wouldn't you want that in any connection with everybody? Why wouldn't you want that with somebody you're falling in love with? You know, we live in a, in a world now where a lot of, um, that is like all online and we have our profiles and we have our social media and it's this kind of given idea of perfection or a, a version of us that isn't us, but it's a public version of us. And a beauty of acting is kind of going, ah, get rid of all that. Let's just, um, show you humanity. And guess what? You're going to recognize this better than you would this thing that you're looking at going, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you you remind me right now in this moment to uh, to share with you a story when I first saw you acting and I was at U of T. I, I think I was in first year university and uh, a girl I knew was acting in this play and she invited me to go see it. And then I saw on the on the roster and the agenda Sergio De Zio. I go, oh, I haven't seen him in a few years. And uh you you dude, it's like we're talking 1993, maybe 1994. Uh you, you rocked it. Like it was just uh I thought I was gonna see like a community play, you know, with a bunch of student actors, but you were so into it. Thro you were throwing your body into the scenes like it, oh, wow. it was a, a an abandon that I did I wasn't used to. Um oh. you know, I, I was 19, 20. What? Like, is he th it, this is not Sergio acting. This is an actor who is Sergio. <laughs> it's I remember yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. I remember watching you. Yeah. Well, I, I so the last the my last point on this, I wanted to share this with you. I never shared this with you. Uh no, you didn't. Uh, well, I mean, because I, it's just the way I am. I like, I don't want to sound like I'm gushing, but I wanted to speak to you afterwards. I really wanted to speak to you. And I thought, you know what? It's just, it's going to, I'm going to, I'm going to look like a groupie if I go, if I go see him, but God damn it, he's good. That's, that's all I remember. Oh, so I John, decided not to. And then, of course, God. stupid, right? Stupid. Stupid. Well, but, I mean, it's kind of beautiful. What? Like uh, 30 years later, you're telling me this story because that's, you know, it's something that it still means the world to hear that you had that's kind of somebody felt that and and you saying that at a time when i felt like i didn't know looking back i go i didn't know what i was doing yet but maybe i did do you know what i mean maybe well, maybe you can throw yourself in at any point in your life and you just it's maybe you hit that flow sometimes you don't even know you're hitting that flow you know it's beautiful thank you for sharing that no, no, I, uh, my pleasure, my pleasure because uh, it stuck with me, and it's not because it's you. It just it stuck with me. I, mm -hmm. I, I was really taken aback. That was a very good experience. Mm -hmm. it, it, like again, it goes back to you. You literally, to use these words now, you offered yourself up on that stage, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I, you know that's. I think that's also why when we watch actors. And we follow actors, emotionally follow actors. It's like a remind, like you're reminding us of when we were like that, because we we're all kids at one point, and kids just threw totally. themselves at things, right? Yes, like we we're yeah, all like that. Good. And it it's felt and it felt good, didn't it? Like, I mean, you still remember it, right? Yeah, yeah. Like and being, it's, I, no, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you being a kid throwing yourself at stuff. Oh yeah, hundred percent, dude, hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, and, uh, when my, and when my kids, when my kids were young, I, I used to just watch mm. and think how this is incredible that they're doing this for the first time. And like every day there's something that they were doing for the first time. And they were just, again, just so immersed in whatever the hell, whatever the hell it was, how small it was. But Absolutely. it's like the, um, sorry, I don't want to go uh, too long on this. I didn't think I would, I would go uh, at all on this, but, um, it's like you're like when, when we're watching somebody offering themselves up like you do, and it's not just you, but uh, also musicians, right? Uh, writers do this in, in a sense. Um, I mean, I would say uh, creative entrepreneurs and scientists do this in a sense, but 
yours is more naked. Like it's there in front of everybody. It's like the, um, you are answering the, how dare you show us this? It's like you're answering mm. that. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. just so open. It's like, how, what, what do you mean? He, it's like, mm. is, he's breaking character. What is this? Like in mm-hmm. a, in a metaphorical mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And you're, ch- you're challenging the, you're challenging the strict upright sense of way to live. You're challenging it by doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Hey, I don't know. It is. Well, I, I mean, know. that's what, you know, that's why they wouldn't bury actors with other people. Uh, like we were, it's like, what, like you guys are, 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 you guys don't belong. You, you guys, you guys belong destitute and uh, not in the same graveyards as us because uh, you guys are touching something that, that is uh, a bit too much. Uh, it's, uh, I didn't know that. You're showing us who we. You're showing us who we are. I mean, you know, like it's people need story. They, they. I mean, God Almighty, like in the Netflix and the streaming, the content. There's so much out there. Um, yeah, we need story to kind of make sense of our own lives. But sometimes I get that. I get the like the audacity of of showing that part of me that I don't even like to talk about. How yeah. dare you? The audacity. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, it's uh, the audacity. That's exactly it. That's exactly what I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, dude, you you were scared of everything when you were young. Again, using your words. Yeah. Uh, the, I'm not going to ask you what happened, but what happened? Uh, well, one answer: life. Uh, one of my favorite books is uh, uh, the Sesame Street book, uh, "The Monster at the End of the Book." Grover, you know that book. I love Grover. Yeah, I love Grover too. And I think this is why I love Grover. It's a whole book where he's like telling you not to turn the page because there's a monster at the end of the book. There's a monster. Don't do <laughs> and like it's fun to read it like him. And he's building yeah. like wood. He's doing bricks. And it's like, please, we're almost at the end. There's a monster. Don't. And you get to the end and Grover realizes the monster at the end of the book, spoiler, is Grover. He was the monster at the end of the book. And it was just kind of a book about dealing with anxiety and the things we're afraid of. And I bring it up because like life happened. Like I I would say about 85% of my biggest fears actually happened. Maybe 90. Um, things that I thought I would never recover from. And uh, what you find is there's another side to the hard stuff. Um, mm. When you're a kid and you're sheltered, and my parents came to that honestly, like they came, they were they were grew up in World War II, like there were bombs falling on Loreto Abrutino, that they would have to go into shelters. My mother, at the age of four, going into a shelter, her grandmother having because she was too large had to hide under a tree. My mother at four doing a rosary, hoping her grandmother was still alive when they came up from the bombs under that tree. Wow. That's uh that's a lot to go through. Wow. And then sure. to move to a new country where they don't know anybody and they 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 all move to the same street practically and they, it becomes about shelter, shelter. And they they brought up a lot of kids who were told it's very scary out there. And in ways that it was true. But um I think a lot of the fear I had as a kid wasn't necessarily mine, but it was generational. Mm. But they also pro- mm. provided us with the opportunity to dream bigger and not be scared anymore. And, and, uh, so that's what, that's what happened. Like I, I was a scared kid who, who thought there was danger everywhere. And, and the more I explored, and it's still to this day, the more I explore, the more you go, Oh, something new isn't dangerous. Trying to do things differently than you did yesterday isn't dangerous. There's actually learning that's only going to happen when you do the scary things. And that's you, a lifelong lesson for me. Everybody's got a, a complicated experience as a teenager. I mean, if, if you're mm-hmm. a teenager and don't have a complicated experience, you're not living as a teenager. <laughs> that's my, yeah. my opinion. You know, it's true. Uh, or it's really happening internally and nobody knows. You think, oh, he's such a yeah. he's doing great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that happened for you. Like you were one of the lucky ones where something like this, like you were, uh, you were literally, it sounded like, I mean, these are my words, you were peeled open 
mm-hmm. as a senior wow, in high school board. with yeah. an experience. Yeah. Do you, uh, you want to share that? How, how that happened? You know what I'm referring to, right? Which story? You're talking about, uh, with our, with our, uh, with our, you were recruited against whatnot? your own will. Uh, are we talking about, it, um, the play? Yeah. The, the play. The yeah. first play. Yeah. Um, so I was, yeah, I was scared to become an actor. Um, uh, I wanted to, this gets more personal, but, uh, I, I knew from a young age that, uh, I, I, I wasn't into girls. I was, I was, I was probably gay. I was, I was queer and it was scared the heck out of me because I was a Catholic boy who, Mm -hmm. uh, um, was told this is going to be very, this is no good. You got to get married. The only way you're going to get out of this house is to get married. So it's like, well, how do I do that if I don't want to do that? And <laughs> I grew up in the I grew up in the eighties where, you know, my my interior monologue about it all was like I was growing up during the time of AIDS. Like AIDS happened when I was ten, and I was starting to feel these feelings of going, oh my gosh, I think I like I like uh, men more than women, and and the only examples of it were people who were. Um, sick and dying of AIDS at a time when if you have had AIDS, you die. So I'd, I'd like, I'd find out people were gay at the same time as I find out they were going to die. I, I was like 13 years old thinking I might have AIDS and I haven't done anything yet, but just because yeah. of the thoughts I was having and because I couldn't talk to anybody about it. And mm-hmm. my, my experience probably isn't much different than in many other people at that time. So I was dealing with that, going to an all boys school, St. Mike's, Catholic school and uh, also going, I want to act, but if I act, everybody's going to know I'm gay. And that was more reasoning in my head because, because gay people act and like all that kind of homophobic talk that you just kind of grow up in, in an Italian community at the time. I know it's changed. I'm glad it's changed. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the world I was growing up in, but you know, I was trying, I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it. And by grade 13, I finally had enough courage to do it. And, uh, I did a really good audition. Um, my legs were shaking though. I was, I looked like, uh, I wanted it really badly. They gave it to somebody else, but at the last minute, uh, the guy who got it, um, got cold feet. He's like, I can't, I can't do this. So father McKinnon, our, our, uh, director tracked me down in the French class, Mr. Tannis's class, I think it was. And he's like, uh, can you, can I talk to you for a sec? He goes, do you want the lead? So he gave me the lead in the show. So it was the fifth son. It was about Oscar Romero, a uh, revolutionary priest in, uh, in, uh, I think it was Nicaragua, uh, socialist, a uh, beautiful story. I mean, I'm playing a, uh, an archbishop and I was way too young to play an archbishop, but here we are. <laughs> uh, my parents came to see it. My parents excited because I was going to be playing a priest because this is okay. Plan B. <laughs> <It's not gonna laughs> That's be plan B. Yeah. 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 This is just as good. This is and, training. Uh, I was, yeah, this is training. And I was sitting there, and our new principal showed up, um, Father Campbell, and uh, he had just shown up at our school, and he was a very charming. Uh, I don't know, if you remember when he showed up? It was like, oh, this yep. guy's got like some life to him, etc. And uh, I'm doing my big mon- one of my big monologues. It's a sermon. I got the bishop hat on, and I look out, and I'm like, oh my god, the principal's here. Like, like the inside voice is like, oh my god, I can't screw this. So the principal's looking right at me. Uh, but I do this thing. I do the play. My parents are there that night. It's opening night. We finish standing ovation, St. Mike's, which is lovely. Uh, you know, first time up, it is what it is. We're probably going to stand yeah, anyway. It's huge. Coach. It's huge. And, yeah, yeah. But it felt good. Uh, got out of the, and it was in the gymnasium. This is before St. Mike's had the theater and I'm walking out and father Campbell comes running towards me. And this is a principal. I haven't hardly talked to him yet. And he puts an arm around me and he looks over and my parents get to me at the same time. And he looks over at my parents and he goes, is this, is this your son? And my parents said, yeah. And he go, this boy needs to become an actor. And that was like the Pope telling <laughs> these Catholics like, oh my God, I guess he has to become an actor. Like he opened the door for me to become, uh, to kind of pursue this dream. The, Ironic part of it. You want to keep going about the story? Yeah, let's do it. It's real. Yeah, it's a real story. Is um, uh, you know, he became almost a mentor to me, and uh, I, 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 we had confessions the same night, and I would go look for him, uh, for my confession because I'm like, this guy sees me. He sees like what I am about, so maybe I can tell him about being gay too. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I hadn't told anybody that. I hadn't told anybody. No, my, nobody. Me. Only person who knew. Maybe some people I messed around with, but nobody knew. Um, but I'm like, I got to talk to him because I, I still want to be Catholic. And, and I don't know how I, I live in this church with this. And um, I sat uh, in confession with him. You know how they set it up all over St. Mike's. And he was in the library. And there was always a lineup for Father Campbell because I think he was a very personable person. Seemed that way. He took a special interest in everybody, uh, or certain people maybe. And uh, I sat down in confession, and I'm like, I'm going to tell him. And I don't know. I have a feeling he's not going to damn me if I tell him this. And I told him, uh, Father, uh, I'm having these feelings, and I don't know what to do about them. But and and he he said, you know, God loves you. God loves you for whatever feelings you have. And it was the first time going, oh, maybe, maybe there's space for me. Um, to still to to reconcile being Catholic and being uh, a gay kid, uh, and maybe I'm going to be okay. And uh, it was a huge part of the road I've taken to the point where I can say on a podcast I'm gay because even that, like being being a gay actor, uh, was a different thing. It was a scary thing. Even during Flashpoint, I was scared for people to know, but uh, uh, I got to hear because of people like conversations like that um a sad devastating part of this is finding out during the pandemic about uh, what father campbell had done at um at schools um at a camp i think with much younger boys that was very devastating part of that story right and uh, he's passed away i think he died a week after this after he was um confronted about this um it, 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 that whole story, you know, it's something that I mean, I'm kind of haunted by too, because uh, mm-hmm. it's inexcusable what he did. To um, I just think about that confession, and I think about like how he gave me absolution about. For me, it was being gay, but perhaps this guy's trying to work out absolution for something that he really probably couldn't absolve, which is destroying a, a young child's life. You know, the world's funny that way. It, it, it's a big lesson too, and for me, and like, uh, there's many aspects to people, and um, it's hard. And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful story. It's a horrible story. Both things are true. Same time. Uh, yeah. 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 Which is something that I mean, a good play, a good movie. These are the kinds of things that. Um, that leave you thinking them. It's kind of like you say about, you know, you see actors and you go, how dare you? Like, how dare you talk about this? How, like, how dare you make me go home and think about this in a way that's not good guys, bad guys. Um, that's not yeah. Pat imaged, you know? You know, as horrible and as um, the wonderful as that story is, I'm sure it can, it was or is, or will continue to be a lesson for you on the uh, on the complexity of the human condition, the yes. messiness, the yes. excitement of the human condition. Yes, and we owe so much to all the humanity involved. Like, I mean, you know, I found out about that story, and and it was the uh, it was the story of of the of the, the victim of the abuse, and and he, um, you know, horrific what happened to him and Mm -hmm. the the gift of, um, of, uh, the gift of his sharing that of adding to the complexity of the world of, um, I I remember, I remember reading that story, uh, at the beginning of COVID that's when it came out more or less, right? The early 2000. You know what? Somebody from St. Mike's put it on Facebook and I'm like, Oh, Father Campbell guy. That's how it started for me. And yeah. then I, I started watching that. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. The bravery of that man. And uh, he's well into his 50s, I think, now, right? Uh, yeah. Or maybe yeah. maybe 60 or something. Uh, carrying that for all of his life. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I have I, to just say, like, I, mean, I don't know. This is, uh, but, but like, you know, my, my biggest question, and, and I'm not, it's not to excuse anything that happened, but I mean, the church knew. How do you put somebody in reform mm. and then put them as a principal of a school. I mean, how does that happen? That is a question that's bigger. That's a more institutional question. And I don't, we, no, we don't need to go that's there. Um, but it's a, that's 
where I go, wait a minute, that's where, that's somebody I want to talk to and actually have an argument with about, I don't know. How do you allow that to happen? That's a good question. And, well, yeah. uh, and not not to go off topic or not to not to tie this end here at all, but uh, I implore the listener, even you, uh, to check out the discussion we had with um, Father John Zada, and he's a, an exorcist out of Philadelphia, and mm. he has he has he had words to share about uh, about the Vatican and about. Uh, uh, decisions how they make decisions and he was uh he was very open uh brutally honest too um i i don't want to comment well, on it just feel free no no no, no feel free fair. to check it's it out fair. and also like i mean it does make you question power in general like i mean these any institution not just the church but like yeah. usually these things that are it's not people that's my, kind of my takeaway it's not the people yeah we, we, we were cogs in it but but there's something bigger that it's like this is broken mm. and we got to find a way to to still our humanity is at, is at risk i suspect some of that has to do with the strong beliefs we have in institutional powers uh and that we yeah. um uh sometimes often always i don't know what the answer is uh but we give maybe a lot of weight to those beliefs in those institutions when maybe we need to look inwards first uh, and yes. check those beliefs. I mean, yes. Uh, and again, I, I mean, like that's the, the indulgence of an, uh, an actor gets to have, which is we spend so much time looking at the human condition. Well, okay. Uh, let's hit that too. Cause you said you have a backboard of quotes. What's, what's up yeah. with that? Uh, it's in the other room, but I got better thing here. Uh, I, uh, I have a, a pin board on my, 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 my cousin, uh, Silvana Dadazio. She's got an interior design company and she, she built my library, which was something we, she promised me as my career took off and her, uh, interior design career took off. She said, I'm going to build you a library one day. And she built it in this, in this home. And I love that room. And, uh, she put a pin board up, uh, for my desk. And I never really used it much until the pandemic pandemic turned that room into an actual office finally, which happened for a lot of people, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, whenever something strikes me, uh, I'm a big reader. Uh, I'm almost more of a reader than a watcher. I love books. I always have. That was always a place where I went to, to uh, find some quiet, almost meditation and a conversation with, like you said, writers, like, I, like they reveal themselves. And it's like a one-on-one -on -one conversation mm -hmm. with, with a book. Um, and every once in a while, I'll read something that just goes boom inside. And uh, and I write it down in my journal. And then I started going, I, I need to look up. When I look up from doing my work, I need to see these signposts that people uh, go, this is what life is about, maybe. And it's always maybe. I mean, there's no like set. But this is going in my heart right now. So I think I could use this to look back on whenever I'm getting a little bit lost in the, in the high weeds. So I got a backboard of of quotes from anything I read, sometimes things people say. Um, right now, actually, I've got a quote up from my dad. Who he told my dad, like, never learned how to how he went up to grade five for school because of World War Two, mm -hmm. and uh, he used to have a a book out when he was doing his checks about how to write the numbers. Like, I mean, that's the amount of literacy he had. But he was the, one of the best storytellers I will ever know, and it came from just telling stories over and over again. And one of the quotes I have up there was uh, him talking about a, a mean uncle who used to bully him. And uh, and one day he picked up some rocks because my dad uh, had, didn't want to work anymore. He, he was 10. <laughs> he was tired. And he was going to throw a rock at him. And my dad picked up some rock. He goes, don't throw that rock at me because I know how to throw rocks too. And he stood up to that bully uncle. Beautiful. Beautiful. And from that day on, that bully uncle always went up to him and said, "Hey, Silvino, how are you? You good today?" Like he ha he won his respect somehow, and uh, so that's up on my board. Like you know what I mean? And it's and June. I mean, my dad passed away this month. It's the same month he was born, and and I I, I think extra hard on my dad uh, this month in a very not like oh, I mean he had a life's long life, um, but he's in here. Uh, he's in here in a way that he couldn't even have access to um, just because 
when people go, this is another thing. Like I was scared of, I was so scared of my parents dying. They're both gone now. But mm. what I learned on the other side is when they go, they're in here. They don't, they're, they're more inside you than they would have been. You wanted them in your heart so much when they're alive, but now they have nowhere else to be. But now they're embedded. <laughs> now they're embedded. Now they're you. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. catch myself. I look at myself in the mirror. I'm like, yeah, there's Silvino. Or I see a picture of myself. I'm like, that's my mom. You know, and it's beautiful. It's we, we're we're maps of that. You 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 told me that your mom taught you to love people. Your dad taught you to love life. And then yeah. uh, it was very cool. Like I, you know, in preparation for this chat, I got to know you better, which was yeah. weird because I've yeah. known you for so yeah. many years. Uh, but I yeah. I'd love the exercise because now we get to talk about it, and you can't recant because yeah. it's on record, man. <laughs> it's uh, okay. I know. This is it. Yeah. Nice. You said you nice. you said you were surprised, uh, but your dad uh, your dad stepped it up. Yeah, remember my dad that? stepped it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I did. I do remember saying that about my mom uh, knowing, uh, teaching me how to love, and my dad teaching me how to live. And it made me think after the fact, after we had that conversation, that and that's why they were together. They kind of helped each other in ways to do the parts of that the other wasn't wasn't as sure. profoundly good at. That's why people sometimes get together, which is thing. But my mom, yeah, my mom, you know, she was the first to figure out uh, that uh, maybe Sir, there's something up with Sergio. And um, she confronted me about, uh, why don't you, where are you going at night? Why, why, why do you not go and stand and try to get the bouquet when they throw that the wedding? Why, why, what do you mean you're not getting married? What are you? What's going on <laughs> she's there? She's fishing, yeah. She was uh, Angela Old school Lange fishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Colombo. Uh, but she found out, and uh, and she found out first because she was confronting me. I had my first boyfriend, and I was never home. And uh, and and I told her, and she took it pretty well. I mean, she took it very well, ultimately. But at the time, she was like, your dad can't know because he can't handle it. And that was more to do with their relationship than the truth mm. of it because um my mom passed away first um uh, too young she was only 63 um and uh and then for 20 years my dad and i had to have a relationship that we really didn't have because i was so close to my mom and before that it was like my dad would pick up the phone hi sergio you go okay okay here's your mother and my mom and i would talk about everything and my dad and i wouldn't um so now it's like okay if i get to know i have to get to know this man if i want to have a father because we don't have mom to connect with us all anymore um, but yeah, and, uh, but this was part of it. Like, you know, he can't know about me being gay. He can't, and I was, a, uh, my, my longtime partner, uh, my first longtime partner, we were together for six years. And when my mom died, the day she died, our palliative care doctor sat with us and told us mom was going to go that day. And, uh, I could see in my dad's face, uh, he hadn't even thought of that idea until that day, which was shocking to me because she was ill for a long time, but sometimes people don't want to accept what's in front of them. And that's fair. It's survival. And it was October 27th, so there were leaves. Our, we had a canopy of uh, grapes in the backyard, and um, the leaves were all falling. And my dad and I went outside and with this new information that mom was going to die by the end of the day. She was in the bedroom. She got to die at home. She had a beautiful death. But um, we were in the backyard, and we were raking leaves. And my father, like, you know, while we were raking leaves, said, you know, Sergio, I love you so much. And, you know, I love HR, who was my partner at the time, so much. And I think of him like another son. And I realized he was trying to tell me he knew. Hmm. Um, and he was trying to tell me he loved me anyway, uh, which of course he did. But at the time, I was like, Mom, Dad should have known. And, and, it, and, and I, I, I stopped him from talking about it because uh, I like, Mom's going to die today. I can't do both of these big emotional moments <laughs> in one day. <laughs> So Take it, it easy. Choose one, Dad. Choose one. Choose yeah. one. But yeah. uh, but then he stepped up again and again. Like he, you know, I I think about our relationship and my mom and I. I mean, we were close from when I was born, and that's usually true with a mom. But my dad and I worked at it. Like we we had dinner, we had lunches together. He was a golfer. I wasn't. I was into the arts. He was outdoorsman. I only got to that later. I got into sports later. Um, but we found a way to connect over 20 years and it was mainly over pasta lunches and then he got dementia and that was a long, hard road and, you know, giving up, a, it's just, 
we it was it's such a beautiful love story of uh, a father and son that found a way to love each other by putting in the time to do it which i don't know i feel like that was um i think we learned a lot from each other maybe we both stepped up for each other hmm. i could tell you i want to tell you one story about my dad that i i t- told a few people but it was near the end of his life um and uh I don't know what this podcast is about. It's going to be all stories. Is this good? Yeah. Story is good. Too much? I mean, we're yeah, talking okay. to an actor about story. Like, how, yeah, how a story. I guess so. I guess that's what this is. This is about story. Um, and they're all true stories. That's another thing. Like Actors like true stories. But uh, My father was dying. And um, it was at the point where uh, he shouldn't be eating anymore. because He didn't want to because I think he wanted to go. And the palliative care doctor in that sense said, you know what? If he doesn't want to eat anymore, don't force him. And we had a, a, a lovely woman helping us take care of him at home. And uh, I got, I came over to see him. It was during the pandemic one day and, and he was ailing and uh, I could hear the fight about the food going on in the other room. And I'm like, Oh, this is not good. And I could hear like, he doesn't want to eat anymore. And she's still just trying to keep him alive. And um, anyway, uh, she came out and I said, I had a little quiet talk with her going, you know, if he doesn't want to eat, we can't force him anymore but i turned the corner and he was just like yelling like you know he was so upset and he had dementia like you know i don't know if people experience dementia but they they can turn into like like children again right Mm -hmm. and uh, i turned the corner my head came around the corner and he was mid-rant practically and i'm like hey and he like he was raging and he saw me he goes hi (laughs) and i said hey so i was like yeah i'm in a hard day it's not bad. It's like, it was totally like he was underplaying what was going on. And I sat down on the bed next to him and I said, well, yeah, I know. Pop, uh, like, but it sounds like you're having a, I didn't say pop. I said, it sounds like you're having a hard day and I'm sorry you're having such a hard day. And he looked at me and he's like, come here. And I went in and he goes, you talk to me just like my son does. No. Oh. And it was the most beautiful thing my father, I think, ever said to me. Because he was telling somebody else about something that, you know, I don't if people who have parents who have dementia, like you feel like you're making a mess. You feel like you're not, you can't save them. You want to save them, you can't. But it's like, oh my God, you're trying, you, it, it's meant a lot, what we've been doing. You, you, you've been letting me in, even through the, 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 it was the most beautiful thing he's ever said to me. So that's kind of one of the last gifts he gave me in the last week of his life. And that stays in me. I get to have that. And I get to even work from that and share that even in a podcast. But also when I have to play something of, of, of that part of humanity, I, I know what that kind of love looks like, you know. It's a gift. So I, I I I never got the opportunity to meet your dad, but uh, I will tell you that that's probably the most beautiful thing he told you too. <laughs> so like that's yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's powerful. Thanks for sharing that, yeah. man. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they need to be uh, stories need to be told. I think that's really hundred percent important. Yeah. Well, I, I, so I, there there are lots of reasons I think you can give for why stories need to be told. Uh, I'm going to ask you to say, to give one more story. And that's because I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, spoiler. I think it's about the importance of empathy. And, uh, you never told me this story. I heard you recount it to somebody else. I said, yeah, I should ask him about that because he's already said it. And I thought, screw it. About two minutes ago, I said, screw it. I'm going to ask him to do it. Um, Uh, and you were, uh, you were just starting in your career, I believe. I don't remember all the details. You were just starting in your career and um, there was a well-known actor at the time sitting behind you and uh, yeah. he did something to help you. Yeah. And without yeah, anybody knowing story. that he did that. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And uh, that would have been, uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, the movie was The Lookout. Uh, Scott Frank who uh, wound up uh, doing the Queen's Gambit, which he gave me a, a very a beautiful little part in that wound up taking me to Berlin uh, over uh, the fall, uh, right before the pandemic, which was great. Um, uh, and uh, The Lookout was this film, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt film, and, and Jeff Daniels um, were the stars of it. And I didn't have any scenes with Jeff Daniels. My All my scenes were with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And he was a wonderful 
acting partner, incredible acting partner. Um, but it went really well. And that's where I, I, I bonded with Scott Frank. And, um, and the movie was premiering at the Tribeca Film Festival in, uh, in New York City. And uh, Scott's like, I want you there because you're so good in this. And uh, I'm going to put you up in the hotel. You just got to get your air fl- your flight. And I was in the middle of it doing a play, but it was on a Monday night or a Sunday night. So I could actually find a way to do it. Or maybe we were in rehearsal. I don't remember. But anyway, I, g- I could get away for a couple of days. And I flew to New York City and I went to the Tribeca Film Festival, my first film festival in America. Uh, Star set at night. Courtney Cox was there. Like uh, uh, Fisher Stevens was there. Um, it was an after party at this like swank, like there was like fashion people. Like I was like, where am I? What am I doing here? What's this kid from down to doing here? But and nervous because it's my first thing, and I hadn't even seen the movie yet. Like I, I, I didn't even know if that, if it was any good. Scott's saying I'm good, but I don't know if I'm any good. And uh, we go into the theater, and it was a small theater. Like it's like this, um, that like remember the ones at Eaton Center? You know those little small things. It was like a yeah. little small like fifty people sitter. But everybody in the room is like a freaking movie star. So I'm like, I'm out of body here and I'm going to see it. And, <laughs> and I'm nervous. And Jeff Daniels by accident is sitting behind me. And I come on screen and I, I show up in that movie about 50 minutes in. So even like waiting, like, <laughs> when am I going to uh, be on? Uh, what, am I even in this? Did he cut me out? I had no idea. Yeah. Um, the deputy with the donuts. Show up. Yeah. The de- yeah, deputy donut, which I love that part. Um, and, uh, and he was a fun part. Like he was this really innocent, uh, uh, character who, uh, you know, kind of reminds me of people I know. Uh, and it's probably why I was able, was able to play him. Okay. And mm-hmm. he was a very funny character. Um, uh, or there were laugh lines to it, but I'm like, are people going to laugh in here? And every laugh line I had, I could hear a very good actor, Jeff Daniels sitting behind me laughing in a, such a warm way that not only like this good actor and not only was what I was doing funny, but I could feel he was doing that because he could see sitting in front of him was a guy at this first film festival who he just met on the red carpet and going, what does this guy need tonight? I'm Jeff Daniels. I already got my shit. What does this guy need? And maybe he needs to know that Jeff Daniels thinks he's good. And uh, maybe he wasn't even that self-aware, but I think he knew it would help. And I'll tell you, that's what made me go, oh, I think I'm pretty good in this. Jeff Daniels <laughs> thinks what I'm doing is really good. You know, uh, those little things help you. And it's it, we're building like careers on dreams and, and there's no like, you know, there's no, okay, now this is a trajectory. It's going to do this when you're an actor. It's going to go up and down. It's wavy. Um, but those little moments like that are the ones that make you uh, try and keep trying to, you know, pursue the dream. He was in a way also helping you build your beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. He was mentoring in a very kind of transient. Yeah. I, I'll never see you again. Here's 10 minutes. Let me help you for a second. Do you see how and, long, uh, like how long that like for you to tell that story, yeah. how many years later? Yeah. How important how that was power to power that has. Oh. Yeah. And, and that's the lesson too, man. Like this is the thing, like these things we're, we can all help each other like all the time. Uh, it is that thing with like, you know, saying hello to the, not hello, but actually connecting with the person pouring your coffee, actually eh, saying hi to a neighbor, actually talking to whatever it is. Just there's a human being in front of you. It's a form of self-sacrifice too, right? Like uh, you said, you, uh, one of your teachers, that's how you brought it up. But you said one of your teachers, Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, Mr. Johnson. No, uh, Mrs. Johnson, my senior kindergarten uh, uh, teacher. That's who you're talking about okay. there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Loved her. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, the, you said that she said, oh, you're good, but let's make you better. Like that's, yeah. that's, what, that's what a no, teacher yeah, does. The, yeah. Sorry. And I've got to give a little bit of props to uh, Meredith McGeechee at MAP. Um, that's what a good teacher does. That's what a good parent does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's the point. <clears throat> that's the point I wanted to make and ask you too, right? Because that's what I think we should, like, we're all teachers. Like Jeff, yes. Jeff Daniels was teaching you, right? Yes. 
Maybe, maybe yes. you weren't great. Maybe you were good, but maybe he saw that you wanted to be better. You wanted to be great. Or maybe, yeah. maybe he saw that you could be better and he was helping, but also teaching. But also there's a bit of sacrifice because he didn't need to offer himself up like that. No, no. It was safer no. not to do that. Yeah. And what his reasoning is, is none of my business. Yeah, All it does exactly. is like, like, like what it did, it was have an effect on me. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, when people say, hey, that time you did that thing, like what you said with my, when you saw me on stage, like I had no idea, just offering. And uh, that's all we can do. Like that's the other thing too. Like you can't, you can't go, oh, I did the, the good thing. So now I'm a good person. Like, no, you did a good thing. <laughs> that's not, like, you did a good thing. Now do it again. Now no, go again. tomorrow, wake up and do it again. Do, it's a practice. It's, uh, and, and we're going to be good at it some days. We're going to be shit at it some days, just like acting. My encouragement. Like everybody just needs a little bit of encouragement along the way. Everybody, everybody, yeah. unless you're a robot. Yeah. We're con <laughs> well, like what you said too, like we're connected. Like we're yeah. always looking for a connection. It's what all this like online, this is like, oh, let's make people connected. Like, well, it's not as easy uh, as, no. as you think AI. No, that's it's, right. Uh, yeah, well, like online, online can't replicate you being in a room with somebody who's encouraging you by a, a laughter that nobody can sense as a signal, but you. Yeah, yeah, right. and just a connection. Just yeah, like, just they, even like even this, like our friendship, like whatever this is, this is built. Like yeah. you got to keep going at it. You can't. It's like my dad and I. Like you got to keep. It's like any relationship worth keeping. If one person stops, it's over. If if somebody were to ask you, um, what what is going home for you? What is it? I mean, it's going to sound cliche. It's it's love. That's it's that's the home. That's home. It's, it's love. I, you know, I already talk a lot about death in this. Um, but I was, I got to be bedside for both my parents and you worry all the way there. Like, Oh my God, it's going to be horrible. Oh my God. How's it going to happen? Like even like the minute where we, we realize mortality, it's like, well, all these people I know are going to die or I'm going to die. Like, is it? But when it, when the people go home in the sense of dying, I think uh, it all falls away, not just for the person dying, but for the people who are there with them. It's like, oh, all that stuff that we were fighting about, all that stuff that we thought was important because we wanted that thing. Um, home is just, uh, maybe it's other people. Maybe it's, maybe, it's, maybe it's just getting back to the idea that we're all one, you know? I feel like in this podcast, I was like, I mean, the whole Father Campbell story, you know, sounds like I'm rough on, on, on Christianity, but no, like I, I also see it as like, I grew up in it. I had a grandmother who taught herself how to read by reading the Bible, you know, and who also, I mean, full disclosure, I found out from another parent who had dem dementia that my grandmother, uh, my mother was conceived out of wedlock. Like, geez, like everybody is complex, right? Yeah, um, of course. But she learned how to read from the Bible, and and that whole idea that uh, you know, like I think the Bible, be it Jesus or be it and Buddha, be it all the religions, they're just trying to 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 get back to this idea of uh, of of connection and love. I mean, that's I think at the bottom of all of it. You know, we're trying, we're trying to get it right. I think that starts with. Uh those teaching moments, the moments of encouragement, uh, that, uh, really empathy is, I think that's, yeah. it starts, it starts with an, uh, empathic view on, uh, your connection with people. Yeah. yeah There's not a lot of room for judgment or shame in that. And those yeah. are two, those are two, uh, those are two things that I'm, I'm lately just like, I don't even know what they serve. Aside from stopping the flow. 
Last question, dude. Okay. Uh, what's greatness to you? Uh, you know what, man? I've listened to your podcast. Like, I, this is the beauty of this time of podcasts and like listening to people talk about their lives is it's what we're saying in this whole podcast is like there is something to learn from everybody. What if everybody is great? And I don't mean like everybody's great. Everybody deserves a ribbon. No, everybody has greatness that they are going to teach you. Some of it's going to hurt. Some of Sometimes people teach you greatness by being horrible. Hmm. But because um, you learn how not to do things. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, I, you know, my, my, my dad almost didn't get to come into, into Canada because somebody said he was a communist because he went to some of those parties, um, those so when, at the time and there was those rallies. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there was a socialist bent in my dad and, and he loved people so much, like to the point where like we couldn't walk down the street without him stopping 40 times to talk to everybody. Um, but now I do that. Mm-hmm. Like, I I love everybody, uh, I, or I'm I'm curious about everybody anyway, you know, and uh, you realize there's greatness everywhere. So yeah, I I do believe that. I do believe that. I'm not asking you to regret anything, um, but you you were very shy about coming onto the podcast for a couple of years. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you broke through that. You decided that, that to lean cool. into something difficult. You know what? I'm going to share a story about you now because you had me talk at an Inspire North thing. Hmm. Remember that? It was at Ryerson. Yeah, a while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or no, 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 no. It was at St. Mike's. And that talk, you were part of that too. Yeah. And I'm like, I got to talk about this thing. And I think it might have even been about being gay or something. And I'm like, is it okay for me to talk about that? And Luch... You know, like St. Mike's was St. Mike's and you know, there was a there was a certain energy to it, but you you were like, It's the truth, so talk about it. Like you just mm. took away any sort of judgment on it and going, No, no, that's the that's the stuff. So in a way you've been helping me. Like we can talk about Jeff Daniels, thank you. That was nice at the thing, but you yeah, thank you for that. Like you don't know the effect you have on people, but I don't I didn't forget that. You know, that's nice. Uh, so yeah, it took me a, it took me a while to get to a place of going. Yeah, sure, let's talk. Let's talk about stuff. I don't, you know, I, I I'm lucky, man. I, I I'm 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 working. I, I go to set tomorrow. Uh, um, and there was a time where I was like, okay, got to make sure this happens all the time. Let's control it. Let's make sure I only. And it's like, oh, relax. Just calm down. Just be you. That's all they've been hiring from the start, anyway. That's something maybe. That's the wisdom of growing up. Uh, listen, you come across. You've always come across to me as somebody curious, uh, and you you have that kind of energy. Appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it's the truth, <laughs> and uh, it's it. contagious. I appreciate you saying it. Yeah, good, good. Dude, this I'm glad fun. we did it. I'm glad we me did too. it. Me too. Me too. I yeah, it's great. It's great. It's good. Thank you for that. I mean, it's it's cool. It's cool to talk about stuff. It's, I don't know. Thank you, dude. Nice to see you. Yeah. <laughs>